Hi, everybody, and welcome to Insight Live and IT Experts Take. I'm Mike Moore. I'll be your host for today as we talk about security and compliance in the healthcare industry, and more specifically, how it pertains to HIPAA security and privacy rules. So joining me in that discussion, I've got two of our very own industry subject matter experts, uh, Mr. James Brummett, a Senior Solutions Principal here at Insight, and Mr. Scott Ellis, also a uh, Senior Solutions Principal here at Insight, both from our Cybersecurity Solutions Org. So gentlemen, Thank you for joining and welcome to Inside Live. Thank you. Um, now, Thank before you. we get started and dive into HIPAA security and privacy rules, I want to remind everyone that out there, we do have the comment section. So if you have any thoughts, questions you want to share as we talk live today, feel free to post those in the chat. We will see those real time. We're happy to address those as we go. So if you've got any burning questions, we'd love to keep it interactive, get them posted, and, and we'll talk about them on here live. So with that, we'll go ahead and get things kicked off. So I'll kick it to you first, James. Um, just a level set on really what is HIPAA, how did it come about, and as we look to today's organization in healthcare, how that really applies and why it's so critical in today's organizations. Yeah, sure. So um, HIPAA is actually a collection of legislation, the primary one being signed back in 1996. Uh, HIPAA is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. That's HIPAA with two A's, not with two P's. Uh, and it's not HIPPO or anything like that. But the idea behind HIPAA is really just to protect uh, patients' rights and the privacy of their medical records. Um, HIPAA, the original version in 96, really has three rules in it. Uh, the privacy rule, the security rule, and the breach notification rule. Uh, the privacy rule really Ooh. limits it's focusing on limiting the disclosure of your of your data, the patient data. Um, requires, you know, informing the patient about the usage of that data, uh, getting their consent on how it's used, and really providing them with a copy of that data. Um, so that's the privacy rule. The security rule is divided up into safeguards. There are administrative, technical, and physical safeguards. And there's a lot of detail behind each one of those things. And we tend to spend a lot of time in the security rule of HIPAA. And the last one is the breach notification rule. Um, it's basically what to do in the event of a breach when any time that the data is compromised um, and there's some limits on, there's some guidance and uh, guidance really, there's directive on what you need to do around breach notification when we're talking about less than 500 patients or greater than 500 patients. So that's really the HIPAA kind of a summary of it. It was it's good, but it, it was more declarative. It says you, sh you should do this, but it didn't really provide any guidance on how to do any of this. And think about it back in 1996, not necessarily even having the tools, uh, the people, the processes to be able to do it. Um, it also didn't have any enforcement behind it. So that's the first piece of legislation. Um, the second one is high tech, and that was an act that was signed in 2009. That's the Health Information Technology uh, for Economic and Clinical Health Act, that was actually part of the American Recovery uh, and Reinvestment Act stimulus bill that was signed after the, the housing collapse in 2008. Um, basically what it did, it was all about incentivizing physicians, incentivizing healthcare providers for adopting a certified electronic health record, an EHR. Um, the driver really behind it from a government standpoint, not only was a stimulus activity, but was really to kind of ultimately improve patient safety, um, improve the quality of care, and hopefully, I don't know, we've seen that, but kind of lower costs. Um, it, it's also where it was introduced to the whole concept of meaningful use requirements, um, basically saying that... Um, uh, physicians and, and implementing organizations, there were some um, standards and the requirements in there, some that they absolutely had to do and others that they had to, they were able to choose from um, when they were implementing. And meaningful use was all about implementing that EHR properly. Uh, another thing that the High Tech Act did was that it kind of expanded the responsibility of business associates or BAs. Business associates are those other kind of third party organizations that work with the primary care providers, hospitals, physicians, et cetera. And they may have access to patient data. The other thing that was about high tech is that it, um, it added enforcement. It added the ability uh, for financial penalties against organizations and it gave it some oversight. It put it under the uh, health uh, and human services group specifically uh, the Office of Civil Rights. 
So that's the second piece of legislation. Um, the third and final one is the omnibus rule that was signed in uh, 2013. It basically allows for patients to get an electronic copy of their record. Um, it kind of further clarified what that whole thing was around what it means to be a business associate. And it also made them liable. It extended all of those HIPAA requirements and the liabilities all the way down to those third parties that had access. It allowed for enforcement and penalties. It also, you know, and it required a lot of updates to our business associate agreements, those agreements that we have between the, the covered entities, the primary organizations and those third parties. A couple of other things that it did, um, it, uh, it finalized those penalties uh, around uh, organizations that were not adhering to the HIPAA regulations. Um, it uh, limited sharing of information for things like marketing and fundraising. And it uh, required covered entities before, you know, selling your PHI uh, to other organizations. So that's really kind of in a really quick nutshell what HIPAA is and how it came about. It's really all about those three pieces of legislation, the HIPAA Act itself in 96, the High Tech Act in uh, 2009 and the omnibus rule in 2013. Yeah, and that's perfect, James. And that's a, a great way to summarize um, several years of, of history <laughs> right there. Um, and really all focused around that patient data and keeping that safe, the safeguards, making sure that we can securely provide that information back to the patients. Um, now, in today's uh, healthcare organiz or healthcare world, I mean, there's a lot of concerns with that. And we're going to be talking about some of those today. I mean, but can you sh share some real world um, examples or statistics around why HIPAA is really so important and the security rules that go along with it? Yeah, I mean, HIPAA is incredibly important in, in, in today. HIPAA is 27 years old. And yet, why is it still important and critical more than ever? Breaches. We, we have breaches going on, uh, significant number of breaches. Health information is incredibly valuable. Um, Verizon does an annual data breach investigation report and looking at the just the specific healthcare stuff from 2022, just last year, there were 849 incidents with 571 breaches that had confirmed data disclosure. And what was the motivation? 95% of those disclosures of information, the motivation behind those incidents were due to finance. They were due to the financial gain that can come from gathering that incredibly valuable data. Um, of those, when we look at the, the bad actors that were involved, 61% of them were external actors, but then 31% of them were internal actions, uh, breaches. Um, and we look at the, if we look at the data that was actually compromised and disclosed out there, 58% of it was personal information, 46% of it was medical information. So why is HIPAA more critical than ever? Because we haven't gotten it right yet. We, yeah. we, we've, we have the legislation, we have clarification from the government, we've had incentives to put in systems. There are still a lot of activities that need to take care, be taken care of in our space because we still have, I, I don't even say we still have, we have breaches going on and we're not properly protecting PHI. Yeah. And actually in our pre-event survey that we posted, and thank you for everyone who, who responds to those, it gives us a great idea of what the temperature is and what we should be focusing on when we have these conversations. But 45% um, said that ransomware um, and ransomware attack was one of the top concerns regarding HIPAA security. So, I mean, that really aligns with what you were talking about there, James. And I mean, there's so many different threat vectors in every organization, but looking at healthcare specifically, and Scott, maybe you could chime on this. What are some of those specific vectors um, that attackers are looking to get in there to get this type of information. Yeah, so in building on James' um, breakdown of the different regula regulations and the timing, back in 2015, uh, there was a Cybersecurity Act, and um, it's not super well known, but um, basically what it was designed to do is to essentially put together a task force, um, federal-based task force, if you will, that included um, public sector healthcare security professionals along with uh, private sector. So it was a good idea to bring both um, sectors together. 
And the goal of the Cybersecurity Act was to actually identify those top five threat vectors, okay, across the industry. So that was that was like the primary objective. It's like, what are the top threat vectors that everybody is basically dealing with? So it came up with the top five, and then it also came up, the second half of it was to put together mitigation strategies. Um, but some of those in particular, the email phishing attacks, right, which we all know are a regular occurrence, right? Uh, you know, when I was in a CISO capacity, I was dealing with email phishing attacks almost every day, right? And then when you talk about ransomware, of course, we know that's at the top of the list, and we've seen an uptick on that in the last couple of years. But they also kind of go hand in hand between email phishing and ransomware attacks. They're, you know, very uh, integrated in terms of how the attack is actually manifested by way of email and so forth. Uh, the other few that were determined are things which are more traditional, right? Like loss or theft of equipment. We know that's always been an issue in healthcare, just from the standpoint of uh, healthcare providers moving from location to location, that kind of thing. Um, the number four item was internal and accidental or intentional data loss. Um, and that's one of the things that healthcare has actually improved on. Um, as James was talking about the industry stats, he mentioned that the greater threat was external. Well, that is actually an improvement for healthcare because in prior years, the healthcare sector has actually been the only one where the threat was more of an internal issue than it was external. And that's because of you know, accidental or intentional data loss, that kind of a thing. And then the fifth one would be uh, attacks against connected medical devices, uh, more commonly referred to as biomed devices. So that's kind of like the final frontier of healthcare security in terms of, you know, building and growing your security maturity. But those are the five top threat vectors uh, that were determined uh, by the task force. Yeah, and that makes a lot of sense. And actually, my background is in network and network security. So I did a lot of solutions that were network access control focused that helped secure those types of IoT and OT devices, particularly in healthcare. Um, but the, the top one you talked about, the email phishing, I mean, that's such a common one and such an easy one to slip through the cracks because it really goes down to human error, right? I mean, it, it's a really fine line at blocking emails to where you have legitimate like partner relationships or business relationships to something that could potentially cause a, an infection in your environment and lead to a ransomware event. So, and, and actually in our um, recent foundry survey that we did this year, the path to digital transformation where leaders stand in 2023, improving threat detection, um, such as phishing emails and then response to those to make sure that we can mitigate and quarantine those types of events quickly are really top priorities this year for uh, from the cybersecurity budget perspective and just initiatives in general. Um, now, thinking about those vectors and email and, and OT security, um, does that really align with what you're seeing, James, when you're out there having these conversations with clients? What are some of those strategies that they're employing to help mitigate these uh, threat vectors that are out there today? Yeah, I mean, it really... Um... One of the things that I, in working with, you know, organizations across the country, different CISOs and CIOs, I mean, the, the, you know, the mitigation strategies kind of fall into two arenas, mostly technical and administrative. So technical, we're really talking about, you know, are there products, solutions, you know, technologies that I can buy that are going to help me manage and reduce that risk? So those you get solutions like email and endpoint protection systems, um, focusing, you know, things around asset management, which is a critical one, especially in healthcare with assets moving all over the place and not necessarily having specific owners of them, a lot of shared devices out there. Um, the third would be around like data protection and loss prevention, um, understanding where your data is, the value of that data and what controls are around the data. Um, asset management, kind of, uh, I mentioned access management, I also meant uh, asset management. So really controlling with access, who has access, where they have access from the levels of 
permissions that they have in systems. If you're getting permission creep, if somebody's moving around the organization and collecting permissions as they go. Um, next would be around just overall your network management practices. Uh, vulnerability management. What type of activities do you have around uh, regular patching, but also regular scanning of what's going on? Things around um, third-party penetration test and vulnerability scanning uh, so that you can respond and remediate issues identified there. And then, of course, unique to us is medical device security. Uh, the joys that we have with everything from uh, modalities in the imaging department to lab instruments to portable chest x-rays to IV pumps, all of these devices that um, uh, when I first started in healthcare, we're barely connected to any type of IT network and now are now fully integrated with the IT network and expected to communicate and interface with the EHR. So, and, and don't necessarily have the type of operating system and controls on them to really be able to protect them. So those are some technical things that happen with uh, mitigation strategies. The other thing is around administrative. I tend to prefer to focus on the administrative things because I don't like the idea of that well, there's always another product to buy or another solution to buy to kind of make me secure. Um, there's a lot more things around people and process. So in the administrative area, it's around your incident response. What are your, what are your policies and procedures and what type of tabletop exercises and regular activities are you doing with incident response? Um, what are your cybersecurity policies and procedures? What do you actually have in writing that says what you're going to do for policy wise and procedure, how you're going to do it. And are those actually followed by the people on the floors, whether they be patient care providers or your IT people, that that's actually what they're doing uh, to adhere to that policy? Or are they just things that some analyst wrote in the back room and nobody ever touches and what practices actually completely differ? Um, and, and again, going back to that idea of, of, of not buying tools, there is not a technical solution for every HR problem that's out there. There, there absolutely has to be that involvement and basically making information security must be part of the organization culture for every member of the team, physicians, nurses, it, you know, ancillary departments, et cetera. It cannot just be a function of an infosec group or an IT department. Yeah. And I mean, that that's conversations we have all the time. And I mean, Scott, feel free to chime in also, but I mean, it's the people, it's the process and the tools. So bringing those all together to get a cohesive security strategy and, and what to do to protect yourself, but also what to do in the event of of a breach or how do you respond to those different things? So uh, business continuity planning, all that fun stuff. So, I mean, obviously you, you kind of unpacked uh, or listed out a few different strategies that we could approach from the different safeguards from administrative, technical, physical. Um, Scott, when, when you're out there having these conversations, are there any places within those safeguards where you see that clients really get stuck or they have challenges or maybe even just things to look out for that maybe kind of a pain point when we're looking to build a program around HIPAA compliance. Sure. And those uh, mitigation strategies that James was referencing, those are actually um, the outcomes of the CISA task force. Um, so I just wanted to make that known. And for folks with a federal background, um, the 405D is the actual component um, of that particular act that is responsible for not only identifying those threat vectors, but coming up with those mitigation strategies. Um, but in lieu of that, and in terms of your question um, with regard to the healthcare industry and potentially pain points, there are some areas that sort of stand out a little bit more um, in particular uh, the governance side of things, right? Uh, this is where we start to talk about policies and procedures. Um, that's an area where, you know, most organizations today could probably use a little extra support. Um, but it's, it's clearly one of the areas that always requires extra attention, I would say. Um, other than that, um, incident response, plans and procedures. Um, that's always uh, a requirement today, and particularly with the ransomware and the other attacks and different threat vectors, um, putting together uh, an emergency incident response plan and procedure is really another area 
um, where most organizations can can definitely use some additional support. Um, other things, I would just say it goes hand in hand with that disaster recovery, contingency operations. Um, you know, disaster recovery has been around since as long as I've been around since back in the 80s, to be quite honest. Um, long before the Internet, disaster recovery was a, a major consideration. A lot of effort was put into it. Um, and it's just evolved over the last decades as the technology has evolved. But when you look at it in the context of today and you look at it in the context of ransomware attacks, uh, it's never been more critical, right? Um, it's, a, it's a really big deal. It's really an area that always needs additional focus and support. And then I would say, lastly, I would put in security awareness and training, right? Because at the end of the day, your staff is your front line and you can spend millions of dollars on products, um, but it only takes one well-crafted email phishing to basically expose credentials, open up the door and the opportunity for bad actors to essentially get in, escalate privileges and do all kinds of mischief. So you really can't do enough security awareness and training and the organizations that I have seen where they've not only put a certain amount of HIPAA and otherwise security training together at new hire, but also continually do it on a, a quarterly basis, kind of a best practices thing. Um, and then also go so far as to maybe even consider things like email phishing campaigns, just to really uh, expose um, staff to those uh, real time kinds of threats and hopefully educate them on what not to do. So, yeah, I would say those are some some overarching uh, pain points that I think are probably applicable across the board. Yeah, and I'll, I'll try to recap that the best I can. So, I mean, really, you talked about a bunch of the different the, the people process tools portion. So when it comes to tools, having the correct uh, technologies in place, whether it's email security, whether it's network security, data protection, um, but also having the, the ability to detect and respond to those, whether it's via a SIM or a SOAR or some kind of security operations center for that team, but also having the processes in place to quickly respond to those, to quarantine threats, um, to respond in the event that something actually occurs, an event happens, but also that ongoing uh, education to the employee base to make sure that we're, we're staying secure, compliant, we're not doing silly things that introduce risk into our environment. Uh, even even down to the end point level, making sure we're doing the right things with our personal devices. Um, so a, a ton of different areas um, to really cover when it comes to security just in general, but specifically when we're looking to, to guard that patient data. Um, so I, I think we already touched quite a bit on the administrative, technical, and physical safeguards within the HIPAA security rule. Was there anything else you gents wanted to add around that specifically? Um, or did we want to kind of go into maybe some some key considerations that folks should talk about or think about as they're they're going on this journey of HIPAA and security. All right, then we'll go with the latter. So um, the uh, so we'll go. I think that's a pretty natural stopping point. So let's just talk final thoughts, considerations. So we've talked about some pain points, some strategies. James, I'll go to you first. So. Um, for an organization in the healthcare field looking to really tackle that low hanging fruit or to improve their security posture when it comes to HIPAA, what are some things that they could really start off with to get down the path? Uh, uh, first is going to be around your policies and procedures. Um, your policies and procedures ensuring that, that they are up to date. Uh, you probably wrote some way back in the 90s. I know I did. Um, ensuring those are updated. The policies are, are, are the more general statements saying that you will and we shall and all those things. It's the procedure aspect of it that really is more, is way more dynamic. Um, if you're, um, and, and that's great, you should get those policies or procedures in place. But again, if, the, if you have those in place and they're not reflecting the day-to-day -day reality of what the staff are doing, whether it be in your InfoSec IT or out there on the floors or whatnot, then your PNPs don't mean jack. Uh, they're just things that are sitting in a 
that your IT security, your compliance people, your privacy, that they put together, they've stored away. You can check a box. You can feel like you're HIPAA compliant. They don't mean anything um, when it comes down to actually protecting what's going, where your PHI is. So th the other aspect of it is, is the saying we always like to have, which is not documented, not done. Uh, for your day-to-day -day activity of what's taking place in your IT department, um, the, if they are following those procedures of how they're managing assets, um, how they're you know handling identity and, and access management, how they're handling you know ads, moves, and changes, how they're handling the network environment, of vulnerability scanning, if those things aren't documented of, look, this is what transpired and look, I can tie it back to my policy and the procedure that I have in place to follow that policy. If they're not documented, it's not done. Um, those are, that, that'd be probably where I'd start off first. Again, I'm, I'm very, there's a lot of technology out there. There's a lot of tools. There's a lot of products to buy. There's no shortage of that. And, and yeah. the organization I work for would be glad to sell you a tool. And there's some good organizations that we represent with. And, and believe me, tools are absolutely something that you need. It's the people in the process that I see when I work with my 20 years in healthcare or with the healthcare clients that I work with today. It's the people in the processes that I see are the shortcomings, the day-to-day -day process activities of actually following those policies so that we adhere to the regulation. Um, and then the people aspect of it. Do you have the right people? Do you have enough people? Um, can you offload some of those things from your people to partners that can do things more cost efficiently and do things better so that your people can focus on other aspects of it? It's the people and process stuff that bugs me and I see way more an issue of than just buying another tool. Yeah, definitely. And Scott, I'll ask you the same thing. I mean, it, just to wrap things up, any final thoughts or considerations that you'd like to share? Sure, I'll take the other uh, third of that conversation, um, people, process, and technology, and probably focus on, from a technology perspective, I would probably put a lot of emphasis on the access control, right? Mm -hmm. um, identity access and management, whether it's on-premise or in the cloud, um, it's kind of the final frontier, and, and no matter what you're doing in implementing least privilege and role-based access, those are really the technologies, uh, along with uh, email, um, anti-phishing, and, and so forth kinds of products that I would put a lot of technology emphasis on, right? Because uh, it all comes down to, you know, people having the right access to do what they need to do and not additional or greater uh, access um, and limiting uh, that access to the least privileged kind of rule. So identity access, in, in my opinion, is, is up there along with um, the tools and software that you would use to try to help uh, mitigate some of the email phishing and, and those kinds of things. I mean, ultimately, healthcare is like an industry with a ton of challenges, right? And just due to the nature of uh, patient healthcare, the need for sharing accurate data quickly. But um, hopefully, uh, collectively, we've we've touched on some good things. We've we've talked about some of the threats some of the pain points and some of the mitigation strategies to better help and secure your environments. Yeah, that's perfect, Scott. And I love that. I love the, the concept of identity and focusing on that. I mean, obviously I mentioned, I come from the, the network segmentation world where we tie identity to everything to make those different access control decisions when someone's coming onto the network. So identity really is the new edge um, as I see it. So providing, granular access and those permissions, whoever that user or that device is, regardless of where they connect and making sure they have access to the right data and, and that the, the data is protected from those who don't need that access. So that's a, a great stopping point. Oh, I see James, you got one more thing. Yeah, just, just one last thought I wanted to add in here. Everything that we've talked about, all of these controls, all of these aspects of it become ex exponentially harder with the more technical debt that you have in the environment. The differences, the, the, the numerous systems, the, the old financial system, the old health record system, whatnot, that's still hanging around so somebody can get reports or, or old medical, you know, clinical engineering, biomed systems that don't allow for particular things. The more technical, you know, old operating systems, again, legacy systems, legacy operating, the more you have of those, 
the harder all of this becomes. The more you can standardize, simplify, consolidate, the more secu- that is really a security issue and, yeah. and a risk yeah. reduction issue for your organization. That's a great call out. And there was actually just an article I saw I'll post on my LinkedIn that came from one Orlandini, who's our CTO, that talks all about technical debt. He even talked about some of the stuff that was going on with Southwest and their tech debt from a software perspective. But I mean, super relevant to the security conversation as well, James. So, I mean, great call out. Uh, highly encourage you to go check out that article as well from Juan Orlandini. But um, I, I want to thank both of you gentlemen for coming in here, level setting on what HIPAA is, talking about the safeguards, talking about the pain points and what we can do to really mitigate that. I think it was a great conversation for those joining. If you want to learn more, feel free to reach out. Uh, love to talk healthcare security, HIPAA, GRC, uh, just what Insight Solutions does in general. So if you're interested, please contact us or go to insight um, or solutions.insight.com to find out more. So thank you, gentlemen, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, Mike.